Hey there, gang. Patrick King here, and I want to thank you for tuning in for episode number 18 of Talking About Horses. In these broadcasts, I try to bring you some of the best riders, horsemen, trainers, equine advocates, and thought leaders in the horse industry for tips, insights, and stories. You can listen at home, at work, in the car, or even in the saddle, either through Facebook, YouTube, or by downloading the podcast direct from the iTunes store or wherever you get your podcasts from. Today I'm pleased to be joined by my good friend Colton Woods. Colton spent his time riding horses, uh, spends his time riding horses for the public in Paris, Kentucky, as well as traveling around the country teaching clinics. His journey began with a desire to fill what he thought was a basic need and evolved into a love of working with horses and riders. Colton, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, thanks for having me, Patrick. Appreciate that's, it. That's it's awesome to have you on here, and we've done uh, quite a few things together now, as far as uh, audio programs and little video clips and stuff goes. So it's great to be able to have you on here for this. Absolutely, yeah, it's super exciting. So awesome, and I know you said that you're feeling a little bit under the weather, so we're gonna try to uh, gonna try to not kill you with this one, right? Because that would suck. <laughs> That sounds good. <laughs> Goodness. Okay. So, um, for anybody out there that's listening who doesn't yet know who you are, can you tell us a little bit more? Who is Colton Woods? Give us a little bit of your background. You bet. Yeah. So, I grew up in a place called High Point, North Carolina. And for some of you guys that enjoy your shopping, you might know that as the furniture capital of the world. And so, we grew up down there. And I got around horses at the age of 16. And like you said, Patrick, that basic need was really, I had to, I knew I never wanted to work in an office and you know, my parents always laughed about that because they're just like, oh yeah, whatever, you know, you'll find a job with good pain and you'll be in an office. And my dad spent about six months out of the year traveling back and forth between uh, the U.S. and China doing import-export. So, you know, he was always like, on a plane or in the office or something like that. So when I kept telling him that, they just figured I was pretty hard-headed and so when, as I got into high school, I needed to do a service project and I ended up getting involved with an organization back home that did equine you know, rescue and retirement. And so initially I was there just to, just to help them out with the manual labor because uh, I was the youngest guy walking around. So they, when they needed help with the heavy stuff, that's where I came in. And as we were there, we kind of started to realize that these horses that were in there were great. I mean, they, they could absolutely get them rehab and back to a great physical condition, but where it lacked was an education. And so, you know, we had everything from well, weanlings to very senior horses that were there to be retired and wouldn't leave. Um, and, but a lot of those horses were very young horses and they were uneducated young horses. And so they were, they would mind their manners. You know, they had basic uh, manners going through the barn leading and stuff like that, but, as far as going under saddle or even uh, some basic groundwork, none of them had it. And so I convinced them to set up a round pin and we kind of got to work on it. And I didn't know who the heck to look to. And I just knew that these guys had horses that needed to be educated. And I had worked for one summer at a local hunter jumper barn as essentially a stable boy, just taking care of, uh, you know, the stalls and feed and turnout. And that was my first introduction, which was just 18 months prior to getting started with this rescue. And so, you know, it kind of evolved from there because, uh, you know, all I knew was how to lunge horses and because that was kind of the industry standard for the Arabian farm that I used to work for. And it worked out pretty well. You know, we got them desensitized and we got quite a few of them adopted out. And that's really where it started. And I spent, oh, gosh, about right around two years with them. And that started, I headed off to college uh, where I pursued a degree in equine science and management at the University of Kentucky. And, you know, again, that was per my parents' uh, will. They wanted me to go to college because they figured if I had an education, kind of like these horses, that I'd always be all right mm -hmm. if I got hurt at some point. And so um, I went up there, and I, but I told them, I was like, I'll go, because I tried the whole try to uh, tell them not to, that I wanted to take a year off. And my dad was smart enough to know that if I took that year off, I wouldn't go back. Right, and right. So, I, uh, I got to the UK and uh, did the equine science management program and told my parents I was graduating in three years because I was, I was done with school. I just didn't want to do it. And I did and then hit the road for about 18 months um, 
with a clinician assisting in the teach assisting in teaching clinics and training horses, uh, going to those big expo events like Equine Affair, Midwest or, or not Midwest, but uh, Kansas Equifast, Iowa Horse Fair, and all across the country, we got to meet so many great people and work with a lot of tremendous horses. And actually, it was just about we're right about a year and two weeks since we. teaching on the side we teach lessons during the week as well as hit the road on the weekends and either taking some young reconnect right now there we go it looks like we are back live um, so gang watching or listening at home uh, I'm gonna apologize about maybe some kind of sketchy signal that I've got right now sending over uh, the video and the audio for this um, so apologies for that um, so uh, so on the road with the expos and the events then you got quite a bit of time sort of working face to face with the public then yeah Absolutely. I um, was assistant when it came to teaching clinics, so I worked with um, helping set up the clinics and all the arrangement that goes into making sure, you know, we have enough participants and where it's at and all the insurance and stuff like that is um, when it comes out of the clinics. So then at the expos, uh, I loved being in the booth. You know, I mean, I love helping out with the horses, but also being up in the booth and talking with people about their horses and what they're coming from it. Um, Helping them find a little bit of direction was always super neat because you just never knew who you were going to run into. Um, you know, I mean, you met everyone from your backyard horse owner that trail rode on the weekend to running into like Ward Schiller at Epon mm -hmm. Fair because right. he was there teaching and getting to, you know, sit down and have a drink with him and just kind of listen to where he comes from and meeting so many great people and working. I love working with the public, you know. So, I mean, it's the horses and the people are just as great too. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. Then, and it's it's so much fun at those expos, like you said, to be able to uh, to meet everybody and to be able to catch up too with a lot of folks. Because I know you know you've got you're busy with working horses for the public and with traveling around teaching clinics. And sometimes uh, the only time we all get to kind of meet up and and uh, visit with each other is if we're crossing paths at an expo. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, let's see. And then you had something to do with uh, the legacy of legends. And if I remember right, you got a scholarship from them. You were the first one awarded that, weren't you? I did. I think when I got the scholarship, they were one to two years into it. I know gotcha. that for sure. It was at least the second year. Okay. And um, I'm hard pressed to say it's the third, but okay. I know for sure it's at least the second. And there was five of us that were selected for the Legacy of Legends, which um, I would say that was that was in between my freshman and my sophomore year. I went and spent about five weeks with um, my mentor Kit Flatland out in Iowa through that program, and that was really what kick started um, the horsemanship side of it. Like I knew I wanted to get into it, but being able to get an opportunity to be inserted into that crowd around so many phenomenal horsemen and have an opportunity to work alongside them and meet them and call them friends. It was most definitely the, it was a jump off point for me. For yeah, sure. definitely. Definitely. And now um, for the folks out there listening that aren't sure or have maybe not heard of the legacy of legends event, that's an event that honors uh, horsemen like Ray Hunt and Tom Dorrance and the legacy that they left on the horse industry. Do um, you want to tell us a little bit more about how that event worked when you were there or when you got selected for that? Can you tell us a little more? Yeah, absolutely. So it was at the, at that time, it was just a, it was a written application where you had one page to kind of essentially um, say what you wanted to accomplish and why you thought that you should be an applicant for the legacy of legends. And, when I found it, I was just looking for summer internships, and I was looking for
but is it, what are you interested in? And I know that I ended up checking Riding Horses Republic, Colt starting. And um, so it really worked out because they did a phenomenal job matching me with somebody who did just that. Ah, uh, gotcha. And yeah. So, but now I know that the application process also includes a written video because, you know, and honestly for me, I was so green in my own education that I, you know, I, I was pretty happy and lucky that they didn't pause our written video because I didn't have a horse to ride. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I was still. horsemanship and your style of horsemanship then too, I would assume. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, as a kid, you know, growing up on a, on the first hole of a golf course in town and, you know, not having, not being around horses, I was around cattle a fair bit as a kid, but not around the horses. And so being able to essentially walk a step towards that, living that cowboy dream, essentially, if you will, um, it was one step closer because I always dreamed of like big sky country out in Montana or the California style. Um, because when I worked at, uh, you'll get a kick out of this Patrick. And, um, uh, when I was working for that equine rescue, you know, I was 16 or so didn't know anything. And it was like, Oh, you can put a saddle on this mare and you know, stuff that you should never do. And so they put a saddle on this mare and they said, well, you're the youngest one here. Why don't you get on her? And I didn't know anything about starting horses at this point. Cause this was, way before the legacy of legends and I ended up climbing up on this thing and this thing bucked me to the gutters on the bar and I came down up underneath her legs and oh no she yeah she ended up kicking she stepped on my leg but then she kicked me just above my collarbone and just missed it but I had a nice hoof print on my back and have it the way that it worked out we were at the barn taking care of those rescue horses on our way to see the film buck really and, wow yeah and so I had a pretty good concussion um, from that. And we went to the little theater. And I, by the time I got there, it was Small Town, USA. So everyone had already known that I just got fucked off. You know? <laughs> and, so, and it was a, you know, it wasn't a fall off, but I mean, cause she got me pretty good. And uh, when we got to the movie, I was just sitting there the whole time going, there has to be a better way to go about doing this because I didn't know who to look to. I didn't know that any clinicians existed or that this was a part of the industry when it comes down to the horsemanship side of it. And so we watched that movie and I was like, there it is. I mean, it was just like the stars aligned. And so when the legacy of legends rolled around, it was, it was everything that I could have dreamed of at that point. Because yeah. Now I was getting to go ride or potentially have the opportunity to ride with some of those guys and Kip who I got to spend five weeks with. He's, he rode with Buck for five years in the okay. late nineties, early two thousands. So, you know, it was, it was just absolutely a phenomenal opportunity to be able to kind of have all those dots connect and then get to meet the likes of Joe Walter, Buster McLowry, Peter Campbell, and mm -hmm. all those guys that come down to that event and do a cult starting and do a ranch roping and just the amount of education, the amount of years that have been put in for the California style bridle horses and just the horsemanship in general. It was, yeah, I would, I, it was an absolutely phenomenal opportunity and I'm truly blessed to be able to say I got to be a part of that and met some great friends that I still keep in touch with that went through the program the same year I did. That's awesome. That's awesome. It's, it's definitely uh, a kind of horsemanship and a kind of education. I feel like with the horses that uh, seems not everybody gets to have that much access to it. You know, you might find it at a weekend clinic or, or something to that effect, but to have that five weeks intensive is pretty awesome. It was, I mean, absolutely was. I mean, it was pretty tough to leave after the five weeks and, bad. because I mean, it was just, it was almost like you're at home. Like there was, it was just that whole mentality wasn't just when you're in the round pen or in the saddle in the arena. It was so much of every day, how you lived and how you went about your life and the decisions you made. And you mm -hmm. can tell having Kip there, like, 
he doesn't ever he just rides horses for the public and teaches a few clinics so most of the time it's him by himself but oh gotcha it, okay it being by himself and still embodying that to the to the absolute fullest degree and being able to see that uh is yeah I, I wouldn't trade it for the world it was an absolutely phenomenal opportunity right that's great that is that's that's awesome so let's take a jump back if you will if you don't mind uh, you were talking about your dad being in the import export business and um, being in China a lot and I recall you had you and I have chatted a little bit in the past about you spending quite a bit of time there is that right that's correct yeah we when I was in sixth and seventh grade my brother was in fifth and sixth and um, at that time my dad was probably spending about closer to eight or nine months over in China oh and and so it, he has a company there in High Point, North Carolina, and then as well as one in Shenzhen, Guangdong, China. And It's changed so much from what I've seen, but I'd love to go back. It's absolutely um, a really neat experience, completely different. You know, living in a, in a city that's one of five that make, it's like five cities that make up the province, and the one city that we lived in within that province had 11.7 million people. And wow. So it was like New York didn't have much on it in the right. grand scheme of things. I'll bet. And, so it was it was a really neat experience, completely different. And at that time, I wasn't into the horses, so I would love to go back and see the Sevens Racing Club and see the uh, quarter horse China AQHA China starting to take the off, and they're pretty obsessed with the speed events of barrel racing and pole bending and stuff like that. Right, but right. They've also got some pretty nifty dressage barns and stuff, from what I found. So I'd love to go back and kind of just see how they're doing it. Yeah, for sure. And and for anybody listening uh, that were we were interrupted, I think a little bit with a cell signal or Wi-Fi signal again. There, um, Colton's talking about the two years. You said it was two years. It was two years. Yeah, yeah, the two years that he spent living in China. So that's that's pretty awesome. That would be neat to go back now with with the horsemanship knowledge and and with that sort of interest and see uh, what you didn't notice. Right or see what, what you weren't taking part in while you were there. Yeah, I'd love to get back someday. So maybe we'll make it happen. <laughs> there you go. There you go. That would be great. So and then you said um, so. Your parents were pretty heavily influencing you for college, which of course, right? Um, and you wanted to kind of be the I think typical farm kid, right? And, and exactly. skip out on that and go play with horses. So talk to me a little bit about that. So when I was applying to college, I was the horses I had just I'd only been in horses when it came to time to apply to college, I was only been involved for probably about eighteen months. Oh okay. And so the whole concept um, was pretty Oh, let me rephrase. I was probably, it was probably about three years, but so I was still really, really new to it. And I hadn't really figured out how I was going to make a living or how I could necessarily like what the avenue was um, within the equine industry. So I was also very interested in going into what you call like your corporate agriculture. And um, so I looked at going to the University of Georgia, um, Illinois, Champaign, Urbana, Kentucky, as well as North Carolina State. And Honestly, when I ended up choosing University of Kentucky, which is uh, it's located in Lexington, Kentucky, which is smack dab in the middle of thoroughbred country. Right. And, you know, and they'll fight to say that it's the horse capital of the world. And so when I got up there, I was like, I knew, I mean, I grew up bleeding Kentucky basketball too. So I was a little bit biased already. Okay. And, um, when we... I decided to go to UK and it was the day before classes started before I really made my mind up that I was going to do the equine program. And 
I, a bunch of people were saying, well, if you're going to go to college and do the horse program like that, you're right in the middle of it. And so my parents were very hard pushing me to go to college mm-hmm. um, was to have a foundation and to have that degree within my own education to, so that if anything ever happened, that I had to have something to lean back on. Right. And sure. so that's what we ended up doing. Went to the university of Kentucky and did the equine science and management program and, you know, got out of there as pretty quick as I could, but it was a, the experience being there was absolutely great. And um, so, you know, when it comes down to choosing that school, I couldn't have been the amount of like the people and the horses that were surrounding it open for very, for a lot of different opportunities um, when it came down to like the legacy of legends and then coming back from that and having a list of people to call and then be able to start cults on the side after school. Um, so the program wasn't exactly what I had anticipated. Um, I said in the three years that I went through, it's a four-year program. Okay, here's a two-year-old thoroughbred colt. I'm like, perfect. But like, they also had horses that had been there, done that for people, because there was people in the program who never touched a horse in their life, but were planning wow. on making a career out of it. And some people were going administration routes, you know, so okay. they weren't really too hard pressed to go. But there was other people that planned on, particularly like being a horse trainer, but never really ridden. Um, and you know, you're there for a collegiate experience. And that little two, two-year-old colt that I had, he was as docile as they came. Like he was. He couldn't have cared less, but we spent the semester getting them to where they lunge and to where they can wear a surf single and to where they can drive. And so it was, it was nothing intense by any stretch of the imagination, but I wasn't really, and I can't speak because I've been, I've gradually, I've been out for about two and a half years, but I haven't heard much of it being changed because when I got there, you know, I've, I kind of had some assumptions about the program that weren't quite true. You know, I honestly didn't realize that it was just thoroughbreds up in Kentucky. I was like, there's a bunch of horses up here and there's beautiful forms, but right. when I got it was only thoroughbreds. And I'm like, well, that's interesting. And, you know, I certainly learned a lot about the thoroughbred industry, but when it came to rain cow horse, they, you know, it doesn't really exist um, too much in this part. And, you know, but my parents pushed me to uh, go ahead and do it. And I said, okay, I'll oblige. And, you know, I was really what made that program. And I've told people when I got to spend time on the road um, and for anyone who might be listening, maybe you're the mom or the dad, or maybe you're even the student that's getting ready to start making some of these decisions. You've got to go and visit these places and talk to the right people. Make sure I know that um, at the University of Kentucky, I always encourage people to sit down with um, Elizabeth Labonte, which is now Elizabeth Jane, she's the internship coordinator over there, and she was an instrumental part in my uh, my journey through. I was in her office like every two weeks, at least, if not every week, trying to find opportunities. And then there was the head of the department, Dr. Bob Coleman, and I always encourage people if you're considering UK to go talk to those people because they're going to tell you absolutely like what the program has to offer. They're going to ask you where you want to go, and you can find out if it really is the right spot for you. But if you're going to a university that are looking at considering a university that I'm not too familiar with, I say, if you do end up deciding to go to college, make sure that you get involved because yeah. that university, I took equine health and disease classes, anatomy classes, all this textbook stuff. Mm-hmm. And, but the hands-on experience didn't happen unless you went outside and you got an internship or you got a job or you got involved with the social life and you met a bunch of people on the college campus because it's really easy to get to school and just go back and forth to the dorm or back and forth to your house. And you're really losing a huge networking opportunity, no matter what university you decide to go to. Right. And as a parent, like, like when it comes to talking with parents, it's like be open to listening to your kids. If they're not really too, um, if they're not too keen on going, listen to them and see what their plan is. Because 
you know, I went to college knowing that I was going to be trying to train horses for a living. And had I had to fit the bill on the college itself, there'd been no way that I would have gone. And, And because it wouldn't have made sense financially or any of that stuff. And so every time I got to do anything with hands on horses, I was on top of my loaded class schedules. So gotcha. Um, right. Right. So you got to take into consideration what your financial situation is because you can go and get a job with a horse trainer or um, commit to an internship with somebody for four or five months and you may not get, get paid that much, but you might have your expenses covered and a place to put your head down at night and you could get just as much valuable in, or resource out of that experience of being in the barn hands on with it. Um, because sometimes the college isn't going to provide that. I know there is some, um, community colleges, there's L triple C, which is Larry County community college out in Wyoming, shared in Wyoming, and they've got a really neat program. And then, um, that feather river college, that I think Nick Bowers went to like, that's a very intense hands on for the horse trainer type. And I didn't know about those until a couple of years after I'd already graduated. And had I known about those, I probably would have been out doing that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's kind of the little bit of the summary on the college experience. <laughs> there you go. Well, now that you're now that you're open for business to the public, do you think going back, uh, you know, if you were to if you were to talk to the 17, 18 year old Colton Woods, would you tell him to go to business school rather than uh, uh, going for the the equine science degree? No, because what I ended up doing was that program changed three times in three years that I was there. And every time it changed, I jumped ship with it. And um, my focus, it was equine science and management, but I focused a lot on the business classes. Oh, okay. My classes were agricultural business classes, and I ended up getting a minor in the agricultural economics because I knew, I like you can watch the industry and how many people are so talented but have no business sense. Right. And so I was blessed to grow up in a family where sales is our, it just runs through our blood Mm -hmm. and having been able to grow up with my family who started the company when I was like two or three and being able to watch them go through that process and get the very raw version of it. I knew when I went to school, I didn't want to focus on the science side of it because that was your pre vet and those types of folks. But I did, I went ahead and focused on the business side. So I probably wouldn't go for a, strictly a business degree unless you're like interested in getting a marketing degree that might be just enough different um to go do something like that but i was i'm pretty ha- like in the grand scheme of things i wouldn't do it any differently um if i went if i had to view the college deal again but if i had to do it completely different i probably wouldn't go gotcha so. gotcha and and that's mostly because you feel like you were getting as much uh, experience with the internships and the you know the traveling around as the assistant and that sort of thing as as what you were actually getting in the program absolutely yeah yeah cool okay and so now you are off on your own open to the public teaching clinics working horses um, teaching lessons that sort of thing um, so tell me about that tell me about the types of clinics that you're teaching so right now, and we had a really, we've offered uh, trail riding clinics to basic horsemanship and groundwork clinics, uh, whether you're doing your groundwork or you're under saddle. Um, a lot of it this year has been very introductory type uh, clinics because this has been the first year for us on the road. And so everyone that was riding with us is just about their first time riding with me. Okay. And so... We started kind of at the ground up, and we did some larger clinics. We did the ranch. Well, you and I had the opportunity to do that mm-hmm. ranch riding clinic um, right. at our facility here back in July, and that was an absolutely tremendous time. And I think that was too much that fun again next year. Yeah, for sure, that was a ton yeah. of fun. Yeah, absolutely. And so, besides that, we've done trail riding clinics this year. We've done your basic groundwork and horsemanship under saddle clinics. And so, um, I don't want to get too. Too far in this because I want to ask a question, everybody, because I know the question today is coming up, but it's kind of phrased <laughs> around that, so I feel like I'm about to blow my cover before yeah. I ask it. So, <laughs> Perfect. See, we've done this enough. You know what's coming up. <laughs> I, had to, I had to be a little more prepared this time. You got me on the fly last time, and I should have known it was coming. There you go, right? But, um, yeah. 
So we've we've done a variety of clinics we're playing around, and uh, I'm gonna I'll get some feedback from everybody who's listening uh, about the. Well, we'll get into that later. So I'm about to blow it. Sorry. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, so our, we've teached like at the farm though the clinic or the we do we've done clinics at our farm as well as the lessons and the lessons that range from anything from we've got a really pretty much state of the art round hen and we've been able to have people come in and they would just want to work on like loose liberty kind of groundwork with their horses because they don't have access to that so we've done mm-hmm. lessons from as basic as a uh, the horse being loose in the round hen to basic groundwork uh, trailer loading and to doing some cattle working lessons because uh, we have access to small group of steers uh, that we've done and helping people get their horses introduced to cattle and the fundamentals of going and working cattle and more or less your ranchmanship and that you're not chasing them all over the farm. And right. uh, so, yeah, we've, we've been pretty diverse. The horses in training have ranged from dressage and hunter dumpers. About half the horses that I get the opportunity to ride are the warm blood type horses and um, that's a lot to do with um, courtesy of you, Patrick, as well as my wife who rides hunter jumpers um, as an amateur. And so we've got her horse in. And so we, in turn, I get um, I get to go to those shows and talk with people and sure. in turn get some horses in training that come from the English disciplines to now we've got you know, some little cut and filly in and all sorts. We got, you know, if it's got hair and heartbeat, we usually are riding it. So <laughs> there you go. Well, that's a way to look at it. <laughs> no, so that's that's kind of the gist on it. And uh, mm-hmm. we do travel to a couple lessons, but here lately at the farm, it's just me. And so by the time you get seven or eight row today and get them all squared away, there's not yeah. much daylight left. And so our lessons teaching and going to people's places have been pretty limited. But mm-hmm. we always welcome folks to trailer into our place. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, so where was I going to go? I had a question in my mind that just left me. Oh, yeah. So um, I know recently you were up in Ohio teaching a clinic. Do you have sort of a, a region, an area you try to stick to right now for teaching clinics, or how does that work for you? No, so, I mean, we're working on our 2018 schedule, and okay. uh, this this year we had obviously the opportunity to teach out of our own facility here with you as well as go to Indiana, uh, we went down to North Carolina, and up to Ohio, and so we're, we're really open to traveling, it just, we have to work it into our schedule, because we do end up riding our training horses during the week, and then mm-hmm. packing up and hitting the road on the weekends, mm-hmm. and so, I think in 2018, it looks like we're always, of course, going to have some clinics at our place, and then we'll be going, hopefully, down to Georgia, North Carolina, Indiana, Ohio, and uh, even up into Connecticut, I do believe, and so oh, that's just kind of where we're at. But then, if there's anybody who's listening that is interested in hosting a clinic, mm-hmm. um, it do- doesn't matter where you may be. Um, we can certainly talk about that and see if there's a time that works for the both of us to make it happen. Perfect, good. And for anybody who might be tuning in and listening from China, Colton did say he'd like to get back to China. So, and he Absolutely. wants to check out the horse scene there. So that would be, boy, that would be a great way to set that trip up, wouldn't it? Oh, absolutely. It'd be phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Okay, so uh, so let's see. So you've spent the time w- as the assistant. Now you're out there doing it on your own, open for the public. Um, what is – I'm just going to kind of pull these uh, off the cuff here for you. Uh, and if you don't want to answer them, you can always just tell me to – shut up and skip to the next question. But <laughs> uh, I think I know you won't probably do that anyway, but you know you could. Um, that, that's what friends are for, right? Telling you to shut up oh, and just get that. to the next question. <laughs> so um, do you have any kind of what I would call favorite challenges when you're working with the horses? Um, you know, right now, the, probably the biggest challenge I have is that I've got to ride a handful of, and mainly they've been finished rainers, but mm. my passion and love for the traditional bridle horse that comes out of like the Great Basin and the California stuff, I've sat on one bridle horse my like in, at all, and at the point I, you know, didn't even know how to like how to really operate it mm-hmm. because I was so used to riding colts. Gotcha. And right. So, right. Um, just that lower of finest, the horse was so far more advanced than I was um, several, several years ago when I got to sit on that horse that 
I kind of kick myself now because I wish that I somehow could just through osmosis or something remember what it felt like. Yeah. Uh, because with my own personal horse, you know, uh, my plan is to take him through that process of a snaffle hack, more two grain and bridle. Mm-hmm. And even with my training horses, I try to think of it as they're all there for something in their own source. Like there's some are there for trail riding and getting out and about because they don't have that many miles. Some are there to be started. Some are going to go into the show ring. But when I talk with the owners, a lot of times I go into it, I'm like, okay, so this horse is a snaffle bit horse. Like that's going to be his future or this one's going to be a hack more horse. Mm-hmm. And then with my own, um, I get the opportunity to kind of play, you know, have a little bit of an imagination. And that's probably what I enjoy most is trying to figure out that process of, taking horses through those ranks you know sometimes it's difficult because horses come for 60 90 120 days or something and they're still in the process of going through maybe the snapple bit stage right and then they're gone and you got to start over on the next one and right. so you get a lot of practice doing your snaffle bit horses and taking them through those green miles but i guess the biggest challenge i'm enjoying right now is trying to advance my own horse um because i do ride him you know he gets ridden first thing every morning Good. And taking him and kind of just trying to advance because it's it's one of those things that sometimes when you get into this remedy of problem horses and starting colts, that horses don't stick around that long. Yeah. And so that's ultimately, I guess that's probably my biggest deal. I mean, I love starting colts. I think that I'll always do that. Um, I love the green horse putting those miles on them. Um, and then the initial starting is probably that first ride. There's just something like you get that feeling in your gut that's, you know, it's it's not scary, but it's it's the adrenaline rush because you're it's the first time that horse is going to be ridden and going through that process, and I really enjoy putting those first rides on them for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's very cool. So that's kind of some of your favorite things there. Um, what about what about some of the things that I don't want to say that you dread, but what, what do you feel are some of your challenges in? either in teaching or in uh, working with the horses? What are some of the things that when it pops up, you just think, oh, gosh, no, I don't want to deal with this? Um, You know, every challenge is an opportunity, I guess. So, you know, I try to take it in that route because it's all my decision to put myself in these situations. Right. I certainly – one of the most frustrating things, and I'm trying to find a way for our program to adapt to it next year, is – Right now, I have a lot of horses in training that are from out of state and okay. or even horses that are very – that are going to be more advanced level horses. And the f- people, they're not there. They want you to put the initial miles and the initial foundation on them. And then when they get to a certain level in their career, they'll take them over. Um, so not having the owners hands-on has been pretty frustrating Okay, mm-hmm. because I can get it done myself and – you know, I got a bit of a, I can definitely relate because I think on your last or one of your podcasts with Richard Winters, he said the easiest thing that we could do was to do it ourselves. Yes, right. Exactly. So I've really, over the last couple of months, really tried to teach my lessons and the clinics without taking a hold of people's horses mm-hmm. unless it's getting dangerous because it doesn't do any good if I can do it because I know I can do some of the things that we need to get done. But particularly you're having your training horses where they come in and they go home and then you get a phone call in you know, a month or so. And they're like, oh, he's back to doing it again. And I'm like, well, how much have you worked with him? And they're like, oh, well, you know, he kind of sat around for two weeks because I was busy. And then right. you just get that whole story. And I'm like, well, you know, he just went back to delinquency and debauchery all over again. And it was at the fault of the human. It's not the horse's fault. And then mm-hmm. sometimes they send them back to you and they're like, hey, can you fix this again? And you have to have those pre- sometimes you have to have a pretty good meeting with that horse because he's like, well, this isn't fair to me because I, you know, he changed, he made that first transformation and then he went back to his old ways because of the human right. and now he's back again. And sometimes each time, sometimes those conversations get a little more hard because this horse is saying, this is not fair. Like, I don't know what you humans are doing to me, but you know, and I, I don't like doing that. Um, yeah. I don't like having these horses return back because the person doesn't put the time in. So we've really tried to find a way. We're analyzing a lot of different opportunities to get people to where maybe your horse isn't. Your horse will be in full training, but maybe part of the full training is I put three sessions on it a week, and then you come out and put two, or I put four and you put one, and it's a lesson. Mm, Gotcha. Yep. So that, you know, when your horse goes home, you're both on the same page, 
for the most part. Right. And they, you don't have this evolutionary little door that's going around and around and around. And the problem mm-hmm. horses, you know, that's ultimately what it comes down to there. Um, that's probably one of the most frustrating things. Yeah, for sure. I know whenever I was doing a lot of training horses before I was full-time on the road, that that was certainly the biggest challenge was exactly what you're saying. You can get it done. You can get the horses going along and, and everything working fine, but without the entire situation changing for the horse, right, and entire situation being the owner, really, and the influence that the owner has uh, or the handler, um uh, without that changing, then the horse is going to just go right back, like you're saying. Uh, and, and of course, at the same time, you know, we can both understand that, that some people's schedules, and, and like you said, you know, some horses come in from out of state. I had horses come in from all over the country, and it's, for some folks, it's not realistic for them to do that, for them to be, uh, to be in, you know, once or twice a week, something like that. Uh, I know I used to, used to have the policy that, Unlimited lessons were free with the clients that I had sending me horses. And while I had the horse in training, unlimited clinics were free. And then for the next six months after the horse went home, unlimited clinics were free. And I worked, I would I would venture to say, I worked probably, uh, I know, several hundred, if not a thousand or more horses uh, under that idea with that policy. And because of schedules, because of, you know, just other challenges of commitments, I probably had, I could probably count on both hands uh, in all the years how many owners that I had that were that involved, you know, with, right. with the horses. And that can be frustrating because then they go home, nothing really changed, so they end up with the same situation they were in because they learn what they live. Absolutely. You know, and it's one of those things, too, that a lot of times, and you know, I have a hard the sympathy on this side because a lot of people go, well, that's just the way that they feed or that's the way that they turn in or turn up because they have their horse at a boarding facility or something of the sorts. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, I end up telling them, I was like, this is all your decision. Yeah. Like, this is completely on you. Like, mm-hmm. you know, you might have the pros and the cons on either side of the fence, but ultimately the decision is yours. Right. And you have to bear the cross on it when someone has to take the blame because it's your decision. And, you know, I try to, I don't, I'm not too good at sugarcoating things. So like sometimes you just have to have that conversation for the benefit of the horse at the end of the day, because yeah. it's not fair to them to kind of have to keep going through these cycles at the, because of the human. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, and that really, ultimately, that's your job, right? Your right. your job is to be the middleman, to be the uh, the go between or the mediator for the horse and the owner. And sometimes that means having some serious down to earth conversations. You know, about some horses potentially they need a new zip code, right? Because the situation right. just isn't fitting for anybody involved. Uh, some owners need a frontal lobotomy, maybe. <laughs> No, I, I shouldn't say that. But, you know, I mean, there, there's there's times when there's just challenges that you can't work out. It has to be uh, from the want on both sides. You know, you can't want it bad enough for somebody else. they got to want it for themselves also. Oh, I've got a horse in now that um, oh. you're familiar with, but he is a sexist, I've learned. And it's, of all the things to say about a horse, um, I had him in for several weeks, and he was doing great. He's doing great now still. Okay. But I had the end, one of my girls that was helping me over the summer, I was like, hey, can you um, go get him out of the paddock real quick or whatnot? And he was a total little stinker about it. I'm like, she's like, he's rearing up and he's being bad. And you know, like I had him, he ground tied the little aisle away for me. And huh. this horse would not participate with her idea. And so I was like, well, that's kind of strange. Like she was pretty handy. So I was like, you can go ahead and set him straight and like kind of have that conversation that you need to have. Because I knew if I took if I took the lead rope, he'd be all right. Right. But with her, and I got to watch it, and then I had my wife Meredith come out, and I was like, hey, can you go get that horse out of the pack? I want to watch see what he does. With females, he is terrible. Really? Well, has been. And far as I can tell, he came from a facility where it was all women. And he had gotten away with pretty much murder to a certain degree, according to what I was told. Mm-hmm. But when I when I got hold of him, he was like, "Oh, this is pretty cool." Like he tested me a couple times, 
But any time you put a lady on him or they – he's getting better about this, but he always pushes the limits. Like I can be sitting on him and he'll just kind of hang out with me in the arena. You put a girl on him, he'll chew the slobber straps up like it's nobody's business. And yeah. he just pushes those buttons. And so it's one of those things too. I've had to put that horse in situations where ladies are handling him because ultimately that's what he's going back to. Yes, right, and right. So it was one of those things that I was like – this is really weird that I'm calling a horse a sexist because I've never seen it before, <laughs> yeah. but he clearly is because he flips a switch and he's not, now he's not like, he just kind of does little petty things like chew on your reins. Um, but it's still one of those things that I have to help now Meredith or whoever's helping me as a female, I have to be there to coach him along and be like, Hey, you gotta, you know, none of this is acceptable because now he's knows that in the past he's been able to get away with it. Right. So that was one of the things I didn't expect. And people ask me, like, oh, how is he? And I'm like, I say that. And they kind of look at me real funny. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, you never know when the next one will come along it's the same way. Right. So. Right. That's pretty interesting. Hmm. Cool. All right. So now, uh, let's see. I'm going to call you out also now on being a high tech redneck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, join the club. <laughs> right? Yeah, and uh, I know this is this has been a whole lot of fun uh, watching you evolve with kind of the social media presence and things like that. Uh, at the same time that I've been doing it, and I know you and I have passed ideas back and forth, and we share this stuff all the time, which is how we get. I think that's half of half of our relationship together is is just all this techie stuff, which Absolutely. feels yeah. really wild because I know I am not very technologically literate by, by many means. Um, but tell, tell me about what you've kind of got going on. I know you've got the Facebook deal going on and the Instagram thing going on and uh, Monday morning motivation and your learning minutes and all that stuff. Tell me, tell me what you've got going on with that. Yeah, so we've got social media on Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook. And so, um, you know, it's, 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 it is like a high tech redneck kind of situation because, um, one of the things that I loved about being on the road was working directly with people and it's pretty, anyone goes, you're going to lose your sanity because I drive to the farm and it's just me there all day by myself and I ride the horses and I can go home. And so through the social media stuff, it's kind of my way of, just being able to have that contact with other folks because it's such a big passion of mine to help people. Or if I can say one thing that is that helps someone else with their journey, then that's well worth it. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, not getting caught up on, oh, well, you know, this one's, this one didn't get any views or, you know, whatever the situation is. And so it's been very impromptu because it's a lot of it's live on Facebook and, mm -hmm. Um, because I don't have a, you know, a D rock or a guy following me around the video camera. And so we do a lot of in the moment kind of stuff. And I will tell people, you know, a lot of the stuff that I share with everyone is where I'm at in my journey. Like, I mean, there's stuff mm -hmm. that I've learned a while ago, but a lot of the stuff that I end up sharing is because I'm so excited about it is because that's what I'm figuring out right now. Right. And so, you know, going to clinics and doing disengaging the hind corners and bringing the shoulders across is great. But I'd really rather y'all go watch that video on Facebook and figure it out so when we get to a clinic, we're not doing that the whole time. Right, you know? exactly. There's, there's nothing against it, but, you know, and if that's what you and your horses need, we're going to get it done. Mm -hmm. But um, a lot of times I like to, you know, and it's all the Monday morning motivation, you know, who doesn't like to start their week on a good note or something right. that's a little thought-provoking. Um, and so I, I really enjoy doing that. It mixes it up. I'm not trying to be a motivational speaker by any means, but, I mean, in terms of the kind of motivation, I mean, the horses can teach us a lot. And even, you know, we've shared different quotes by people that are far from involved in the um, equine industry to little lessons that um, I ended up going through within the last week. And we do a little bit on Snapchat and then Instagram. I've done one or two things on the live there, but I have most of the Instagram stuff is uh, photos and videos. It's the CWH Learning Minute, which mm -hmm. um, we've been doing, which is – something that we initially started it as a way to share something that I learned every day. Yes. And, and now we, I, I'm still doing that, but we're also incorporating, I want to incorporate more of stuff that I think people will found, find more useful other than like what I find to help me out that day. Like maybe okay. it'll, maybe that 
hits at home with some people, but also I've done a couple of videos where it's been more fundamental based on your horsemanship or what to do with your horse or what not to do with your horse. Mm. And so we've kind of, I, I kind of kicked the door open and we initially, we initially had it set up as an everyday thing, but service out there is terrible. Uh, and that's that, great. that ultimately has been the hardest part is doing is the service. And mm -hmm. so, um, it hasn't quite been every day, but we're still, we're still getting after it. Every Monday you can catch us doing the Monday morning motivation though. Cause I usually do those before I leave the house and lose the Wi-Fi. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. And that, that can be, I know can be quite a bit of a, a challenge there for a while. I was doing, a, uh, daily question and answer videos and it, it does, it gets to be where you're in some areas where there's just no reception, there's no signal, there's no Wi-Fi, things like that. Uh, and so that can be quite a bit of a challenge. So that's, I, I make the joke that they're almost daily videos yeah. now. Yeah. I mean, we put them out as often as we can, yeah. you know, but somebody commented on one of them. I did a video where I had a little filly and we had just done lateral flexion, but I was waiting on her hindquarters just to untrack. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about for her, the filly needed to kind of get those reins reconnected down to her feet. Mm -hmm. And because she was getting a little sticky in the back up. And so I was just finding different ways. And the lady commented, she's like, oh, I'm so glad you didn't push on her during the live video just because it was live. Because I sat there for like five minutes. And, you know, right before I did the video, she was doing it as soon as I picked up on her. And gotcha. So okay. Uh -huh. live, and I'm like, I'm just going to sit here with you guys until she does it. And I'll talk to you through it. And, you know, ultimately, I mean, these videos, I do them when I can and when the schedule allows. But, you know, I've got a barn full of training horses, too, that kind of they have to get rode every day and they've got to come first. So if I right. get on a roll and we're doing one every day and all of a sudden we get busy, it's just because we got busy. It's not because we stopped doing them all together. Yep. Yep. That's awesome. And that one with the, the backup, that was just recent, wasn't it? It was. It was about two days ago, maybe. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I thought I, I haven't had a chance to to watch it yet, um, but I, I remember seeing it pop up there. So It was with that same little dun filly, the cowbred, that was really similar to Dee Dee's mare. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. I'm definitely going to have to go take a look at that now. Yeah. Sorry. yeah. She's super now. I, like that. I love that little horse. She's super fun. Talking yeah. A lot. That's awesome. She's, she's definitely a great-minded little thing. That's awesome. She is. We've just we've got a flying lead change in the back, but we don't. She's she hasn't quite caught the front up, and you know, flying, teaching the flying lead change, I'm pretty green at, but I'm tickled pink because I've got her changing behind. We're just trying to get her mind to do the front as well, mm -hmm. and so often they change in the front, and someone's like, right. they're like, some people come in, they're like, oh, she she got it in the back, but she didn't get in the front. And I'm like, well, I'll take that any day of the week. <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. The front will come along pretty easy. Yeah, that's great. That's great. So, um, speaking of her, and we talked a little bit, you were talking a little bit about the bridal horse stuff. Talk to us about that, about um, maybe kind of your ideas behind the bridal horse stuff, your experience with that. I know you said you've you pretty much you sat on one official bridal horse at this point. Uh, for the listeners out there that don't know what that's all about, what that whole process is, or what what it means to have a bridal horse. Can you talk us through a little bit of that? You bet. So traditionally, all of this is based out of the Great Basin, California style, um, where these guys would end up riding their horses on their ranches, and they have all this time, well, they're because they're essentially glorified trail riders. They're out looking for cattle, and mm -hmm. then when they find them, they dock them and stuff. But they spend so much time just riding through the country that they've got – this opportunity to really start refining these horses. And so traditionally you'll see, you'll notice that people like myself and um, a lot of folks that end up starting colts at the initial phase, they'll ride them in a halter for maybe one to three rides. Mm -hmm. And because they've done their groundwork and that's what the horse really understands. And then, you know, maybe within the second ride or so they might pack a snaffle around and usually after three rides or so, you know, you you've moved on, you've dropped the halter. And now they're starting to learn to operate within the snaffle bit. And they spend around a year or so. Um, if everything's kind of going pretty groovy that they'll spend a year, year and a half. But I mean, I've got horses that are spending longer because that's what people are going to keep riding their horses in, but they'll you'll get them to where, you know, you've got a nice stop on them. They back up and they turn left, they turn right, they do a rollback. 
Um, and all this, of course, depends. You know, I start warm blood cults like this, but so when I say they're going to stop, they're not stopping with something that maybe has a reining or a cutting horse kind of breed to them, mm-hmm. but they understand how to work off your seat. And you, you won't go through the maneuvers of turn left, turn right, you know, half pass, side pass, um, basic flying. You know, you might start them on the beginnings of a flying lead change with taking them over a log or like. So they go through the snaffle bits phase. And then they move into a hackamore setup. And so there they'll um, essentially, they go straight into it. So they'll be doing the same maneuvers and everything that they knew how to do in the snaffle, except for now they're in a hackamore setup. And they'll spend about a year or so in that. And because it, it works completely differently, whereas you put slobber straps on your snaffle bit as a signaling device. So mm-hmm. when you move them into a hackamore, they end up actually, um, the hackamore itself is a signaling device. So you've got more feel in the reins to them. So they'll, they'll have to learn how to operate in that. And they're doing all the same maneuvers as a snaffle. And you're ultimately trying to get them to where you, you're trying to ride them one handed, where you have to get them to where you're riding them one handed for the most part. Um, and that's what you're ultimately working towards. And then they go into something called the two rain. And the two rain is, a smaller version of a boat or the hackamore set. So um, that will end up slip sliding or be up underneath. You put this um, Bozalita or not Bozalita. Um, now, Patrick, you got me on the, <laughs> the, the under bridle Bozal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's a smaller um, version of a hackamore and you'll usually traditionally they have, you know, horsehair reins or something like that. And then you'll put the, a lot of people will put like a half breed bit in this horse's mouth and you won't pick up on it. And so now they're riding in something that is fixed in the cheek pieces and it, had, it works with more leverage. It's a leverage bit. And these horses in this style, they're not put in leverage bits because they failed the snaffle. They're putting, they're put into a leverage bit because they're advanced and they're, they understand how to operate in it. So traditionally, a lot of times you might spend six months just riding and what, like I just said, the underbile, the smaller version of the hackamore, and never picking up on those reins. Mm-hmm. And that horse learns how to carry it. Um, in these bits, you might hear a horse, if you see one riding in the style like this, you might see them work in their mouth, and you'll hear this sound, and it's a copper roller called a cricket. Mm-hmm. And that horse is just sal- like working its mouth and getting salivation going. And so they'll spend um, probably a year, two years in the two rein. And as you progress through that, you're start after probably, I mean, it all depends on the horse. So, I mean, people say six months, but, it, you know, it might take anyone who's never done it before. It might take you a lot longer. But sure. the whole idea of this process is there's no rush mm-hmm. because these guys out in Cal- like the Great Basin and out west, they had all the time. They're not in a hurry to advance these horses. They're just taking advantage of the fact that they spend all day on their horses. Right. And they can actually make them very handy. And so they'll have them eventually you'll start to transition to where you pick up a little bit on that bridle bit. And, um, and then when you eventually you're riding just in that bridle bit and your, the range to your hack and setup is, um, or to the under bridle of your two rank is just sitting. You're not even picking up on it. And ultimately your real bridle horse is a horse that's ridden, in a spade bit, which, um, if anyone's ever seen one, it's a pretty hefty piece of equipment. Um, but the reason these horses can be ridden with something that has such a big spoon on it or something like that is because they're so advanced and they understand how to operate with it. And they've been given the time to learn how to. And so mm-hmm. I really like it because I mean, you, these horses might be, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, and probably at least, you know, but and traditionally a lot of times, but, um, I know that I was talking to actually was on the phone with Dee Dee yesterday and she was kind of telling me all the exciting news with the two rein horse or actually she's, I guess, technically straight up in the half breed. <laughs> right. Uh, right. Right. <laughs> Which sounds kind of funny, doesn't so, it? Straight up in the half breed, but <laughs> yeah, she'll probably get me for saying that. But, <laughs> yeah. and so, but a lot of times guys, you'll hear straight up in the bridle. And what that means is that the horse is operating strictly within your bridle piece with, and they don't have the terrain on. And um, at that point, you know, I don't know if any horse has ever finished, but at that point, they've earned that right. They've gone to the snaffle to hack one of the terrain, and now they're in a spade bit. And it's a really neat process. I mean, there's a lot of 
um, I think, culture and authenticity that goes with that. And, you know, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a dying art, but you sure don't see it on the East Coast as much. Mm -hmm. And um, there's something about it that I just, you know, I get excited about, you know. Yeah. You that warm gut feeling of this is so neat and this is super cool because – of just the whole process and your horses are actually advancing. You don't see them being stuck in some correction seaport or something stupid because they fail to snaffle, you know, and they're putting right. a headset on horse. Like you don't see that in the true sense of what this process is about. Right. Exactly. And I think that's great. Uh, you know, kind of funny what you said about the, you know, uh, you see it more on the West coast. I've always found it kind of comical that, uh, on the East Coast, if you're riding a horse in a hackamore, people think, wow, he's really well trained. You can ride him in a hackamore. And you go to the West Coast and you're riding a horse in a hackamore and everybody thinks, oh, geez, he's on a real green one there. He's, he's not yeah. got a whole lot of handle on it yet. You know, yeah. uh, I've always thought that was pretty funny. And, and over here, you ride a horse in a spade bit, say, and everybody thinks, geez, oh, man, you've, you've got to have a lot of bit on that horse to get him stopped. He must not. He must not have a lot of control. Yeah. And you ride that same horse on the West Coast, uh, and they think, oh, man, that's got to be the best horse on the ranch, you know, because he's right. he's wearing his doctorate degree in his mouth, you know. So it's it's really funny to me. It's always been funny, um, the difference regionally in, in how people think about that. And, of course, now that we've got technology the way that it is and, and information being shared the way it is, I find it's not so much a West Coast, East Coast location now, but almost more a Western Eastern kind of mindset, right? And awareness even. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you see horses going around in a ported bit around here being in Kentucky. And, you know, a lot of times you, you question, okay, you would, I would assume they can be ridden in a snap. And they're like, Oh no, he'll run off with you. Back. Yeah. Right. Right. Exactly. You know, it's like, well, they shouldn't go to that because they failed in the snaffle. Right. But it is just that mindset and a different methodology. And, yeah. um, you know, I know they got your Texas cow puncher kind of style, but I honestly, I'm not all too familiar. Um, it'd almost be like a hybrid version between this mindset that you're sharing as well mm -hmm. as in between that and the California style. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So, right. Well, speaking of a hybrid idea and, and talking about these kind of ideas of transitions, we had some questions come in, and one of them kind of involves that a little bit. Okay. Do, you, do you mind if we go to the questions here for a few let's minutes? Cool. Yeah, okay, so Tracy sends in the question, and she's asking, what's your opinion on the best bit to use to transition from a snaffle bit to a bit with a shank, and why? That's an interesting question. Um, you know... I've played around with um, a bit, and I essentially I would encourage if you're gonna go and you feel like your horse is advanced, you know, and you're not gonna go through this California style, we're gonna go into a hackamore and then into like a two grain. Then maybe you go with um, a ported bit that has um, the shanks have they swivel so you can get more lateral, and mm -hmm. rather than having a fixed mouthpiece. Um, then you could go to something that actually swings out. So when you pick up on it, it enables that horse to kind of tip their head with their ears level across. Um, but, you know, a lot of times I've played around with it a little bit, but I would much rather, like my personal horses or any of my client horses, I'll take them through that two-rein setup. And it's not that hard to get them operating the hackmore. It takes a – I love riding a hackmore because it gives you – you have to be – your timing and your feel has to be a lot better. Right. So to me, that's a personal challenge. But then I would rather take a horse and put them in a hackamore and teach them to operate in that and then put them in, even if it wasn't a very significant ported bit, um, you give them some way to transition because they learn to carry that bit. And um, But if you're going to jump straight from a snaffle to something that is um, ported or has shanks in it, you know, I've used before just experimenting. I've done, it had a snaffle mouthpiece or rather just two-piece snaffle and the uh, shanks, they they weren't fixed, so you could get that more lateral out of it. Um, I just try to bridge the gap, you know, as much as I can without just rocking their world. Yeah, gotcha. So that would be more like, uh, what's that older style, the Argentine snaffle or something? Yeah, I'm terrible with the names on those snaffles. <laughs> I could draw you a picture of it. Or there you the go. Picture. Right, I, right. Well, and it so seems like everywhere you go,
not snug, but it's there to be engaged mm -hmm. because that's how those bits work. And so a lot of times you'll find horses might not be, they're a little confused initially because they're having pressure somewhere they never had pressure before. So right, right. just something to keep in mind. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Okay, so let's see. Um, Suzanne popped in with a question, and this question came about the time when we were talking about the horses uh, horses in training and owners coming to work with the horses. Uh, her question was, how do you handle owners that are not that committed and they betray the horse uh, every time you fix it? She says, I feel like I'm too harsh being the horse's lawyer sometimes. What do you say to them? Do you refuse to work with them? No, I don't refuse to work with them. Um, I've had horses come in where, you know, Suzanne, I've had this situation. And, um, you know, the best thing I can do is just explain where I'm coming from and why I'm in, like, why it's so important. Um, even over the last couple of weeks, I've spent a lot of time talking with people about how blunt do you get. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times, you know, okay, so now this certain scenario, they're betraying the horse which is completely unfair, or a lot of times it's a situation of them getting hurt and they don't even know it's coming. Yeah. And so I think both of them, though, like, it's ultimately about the horse. So as frustrating as it may be, um, I'll do my best with them. But if it becomes one of those things where it's not fair to the horse because they're constantly sending you back to you, I would lay down the law. I'd be like, listen, if you're going to keep this up, this isn't fair to the horse. Like either you need to find a different horse or you need to find somewhere else to go. Because if you're, and Suzanne, I don't know if you're running a training barn, but you know, if you're dealing with those kinds of people and other people see them the same way that you've described, it's not going to do you too many favors at the end of the day. Cause other people are saying, Oh, you know, she gets pretty harsh on those horses and then they send them to the trainer and the trainer has to get into them a little bit and get them back and going. And then the person comes in and screws it up. Like, right. I, I'd spend a lot of time trying to get that person to really understand. And, you know, you, a lot of times people don't check their emotions and their personal stuff at the door. But sometimes with something like that, you need to get pretty personal. Yeah. And you need to make it personal for them and be like, you know, and, you know, question the morality of it and question some stuff that, you know, as humans, that's our foundation. And they may not appreciate it, but, and they may not appreciate it today, but they might appreciate it in 10 years or so. And at that point, you can just do your best and move on. Right, right. Well, and, and I know I've, I've caught myself telling people plenty of times that I'd sooner have them walk away from me with a broken heart than a broken neck, you know. Absolutely. Um, and that's what it comes down to sometimes, you know. Sometimes there are people uh, that aren't going to put in the time. They aren't going to listen. They they. But they just don't understand, right, in that moment. Um, and it, it's like a, I had a friend tell me this years ago, and I've kind of always hung on to it. Uh, she said that, you know, there's three kinds of people in the world. There's the kind that get it. There's the kind that are trying hard to get it. And there's the kind that are incapable of getting it, either presently or permanently. And it doesn't make them good, bad, or otherwise. It's just where they are, you know. And, and I mean, we've all been in places in our lives, in positions where some of the things that we were working with, working on, thinking about, we just weren't ready, right? We were in that moment incapable of getting it, you know. Uh, and and that's, that's life. Uh, unfortunately, when we're working with the public, uh, when we're working with horses like this, it's, it can be a challenge. And so many riders, so many trainers I see get involved because they say, well, I don't want to deal with people. I just want to deal with horses. <laughs> Good luck with that, right? Yeah, absolutely. I said the same thing when I was at that equine rescue. But then I, you know, I actually taught a clinic down there before I left. Okay. I, I learned a couple things. And I was like, you know, I was like, let me come in here and kind of just show you guys what I've been doing with these horses. And I just, I got that itch. Like I realized how much I enjoyed sharing with other people you know, what I've learned and like what they can do to help better that relationship with their horse. But, you know, and also like for Suzanne's point, sometimes it's tough when you look at people in the eye and you realize they don't want it as bad as you. Yeah. And it's really tough to understand that because this is, you know, like for you and I, Patrick, this is what we do for a living. Right. Exactly. And so we eat, breathe, sleep and love it. Right. And to look at somebody and we realize they just don't want it as much as me, so I'm going to help them as much as I can for where they're at, but I'm not going to put any more effort in. 
Right. And like not try to beg them to do it because at that point you're not, you know, I, mean, I feel like you're just, you know, beating your head against the wall sometimes. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> Okay, so let's see. Scrolling down here, Joanne has a question. Do you have any advice on losing the fear of cantering? That's a great question. Yeah, you should canter. Um, you know, really, you know, when it comes down to it, I, you know, going just off that information, um, you know, a lot of times people are afraid to get back on a horse. Well, you got to get on the horse. And, um, I'd ride with people that, you know, I find even riding with a group of people and maybe a round pen or an arena, um, mm -hmm. a small arena. But I, I love the idea of going in the round pen and moving your horse around and you watching your horse move at the canter and realizing they're not going to break in two. I'm not sure exactly what the fear is here other than just the speed. Right. But, you know, I'd walk, trot, and, you know, just practice on picking up on the rain or sitting down on my seat, stopping the horse at the walk in the trot. And then being there where you don't have to worry about steering and being around pan or on a lunge line mm -hmm. or something like that, where you can sit there and you can focus on you and your horse is just going to go around in circles and yeah. you can sit there and you have like your friend in the middle or whoever, and they're there to coach you and be supportive. And you can sit there and you can focus on getting your seat right, getting your legs where they need to be, mm -hmm. keeping your chin out, getting your shoulders back. And you can keep working on that, but I would do it in a controlled environment. I wouldn't go out in the open prairie and kick them into high gear for the first time. Um, but yeah, that's, I mean, you got a canter, you know, you can try it all day long and you can get super, super comfortable with that, you know, and I've even had it myself, uh, Joanne, where you have a horse come a little, get a little bit worried, um, on usually with me, you know, sometimes it's those young horses and those first couple rides mm -hmm. and my own personal horse, he rattled my boat pretty good. And, <laughs> You know, and you and I talked about that, Patrick. Right. And, um, ultimately, I think you and I talked about it, and I was like, you know, I got three rides on him. And we're, the first ride was really tough and because I didn't have – he was having trouble getting forward, and mm -hmm. and I did the 30 days of groundwork, and I was like, I feel like I, had, like I covered my base now. You just kind of told me, you're like, you got to ride. Yeah. Well, and that's sometimes what it just came down to, and sometimes you just got to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and But doing it in a controlled environment, doing it with somebody there is that they can help you – you're really worried about your horse, maybe clip a lunge line to him so that way you know that your friend in the middle can kind of get control of them. But check all this stuff out before you get on them. You know, when you pick up on that lunge line that they roll their hind end across and they stop. And um, and then I just get to it, you know, and be – and when you're comfortable, you know, you know there's going to be those times where you get uncomfortable. But right. we just did a video on this. And when you get uncomfortable, that's when you're going to grow. And right. if you stay complacent all the time, you're going to stay right where you're at. And so – um, that's kind of what I'd recommend there for that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I don't know about you, but I've never been able to improve anything by avoiding it. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, that's absolutely sums it up. Yeah. So hopefully, uh, for Joanne, that, that helps you out. Um, you know, do it, right? Do it, do it. Absolutely. More. Get to it. Yeah. Be smart about it. Get to it. Safety there you go. third, I think is what you teach. Safety third. Yeah, there you go. Right. There you go. <laughs> Safety third. Exactly. Okay, so Byron puts in a question here. Byron says, Colton, you're talking in years for the bridle horse training, but in that year, how much ride time is the horse actually getting? And what emphasis in teaching a bridle horse does riding with your seat encompass? Well, riding with your seat is everything. Um, you know, from the first ride, mm -hmm. you're trying to teach those horses to operate off your seat. Right. Um, you're not, your reins aren't there to stop your horse. A lot of people do that, but they're not there to like the reins aren't, um, they're not the, like, I feel like some people use the reins as the no. It's every time they pick up on them, they're like, no, don't do that. Or no, don't do this. Mm -hmm. And the horse just grows to resent that. And, um, I really like what you said, Patrick, and I've used it a handful of times. And of course, you know, I told folks, uh, hey, you need to check traffic thing out because, you know, when you said that your inside drain is education and suppleness, like if every time you pick up on your inside drain, whether it's in a hack or in the snaffle, and you pick up on your horse and you're like, I'm either educating him or I'm getting him soft. Like, it's a game changer. Mm -hmm. And so to have, because it's a mental mindset, it's not I'm picking up on him to stop him. But, you know, Byron, like in terms of the time, you've got like, 
you know, those boys out west, I mean, they're riding the same horse all day or at least half a day. Mm -hmm. And so they're putting in a lot of hours, you know. I mean, they're putting in four to, you know, at a minimum probably four, but then up to, you know, 12 hours in the saddle, depending on what they're up to. Mm -hmm. And um, for my own horse, you know, he gets ridden every morning and his rides are anywhere depending on where we're at. I mean, he might just have a real quick, easy ride that's 30 minutes and it's pretty intense. Yeah. Or he had a really good ride the day before and I still want to get on him, but we're just going to go out and kind of wander around. And then there's the moments where he gets ridden for two hours. Right. And, you know, it's all relative based on what you're doing. Are you moving cattle? Or are you working mm-hmm. on carrying a soft feel? Um, we, yeah, it just depends on what you're doing. But these guys that are doing the bridal horse process, it's a lot of hours and in the midst of years. And so yeah. um, now you've got your rain cow horse events where, you know, these horses are started as two-year-olds and they go in the snaffle by the time they're three. And, or they're in the snaffle, but they show at three, and then they come back as a hackamore horse at four and five. And mm-hmm. I think it's six, and I don't know if it's six and seven or if it's just six, they're they're in the two range. And then eventually, I think by seven or eight, they're straight up in the bridle. So, they, I mean, these horses, but they're getting ridden quite a bit, too, because they're in a, sh- you know, in a show barn where someone's getting on them and loping them around and getting them just fit. And then the trainers getting on and doing the cattle work or the more finessing. Mm-hmm. And so even those horses that where they've created a show event around the bridal horse, those horses have put in a lot of time by right. the time they've reached the bridal process, the bridal at the end. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. So Chris sends in, sends in a question. Chris says, I'm so confused about bidding. My mule goes in a correction bit with swivel shanks. And that's what some of these mule guys suggest. I've been wanting to eventually get him in a snaffle. Am I just an East Coaster? She asks. Uh, I always thought the least amount of bit to get the job done was the best. I agree. You know, I mean, they're not, they shouldn't be moved up into the bits like we were talking about because they failed something that's more basic. Right. Um, so, you know, I've had, we've had plenty of horses, I'm sure you, you too, Patrick, have come in and they're like riding them and, a shanked bit and they're like, Oh, he's running through that. He's slipping his head upside down and he's just not listening. Mm-hmm. And I, I'd go back to the round pit and snaffle on him. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, when it comes to the mules, I had the opportunity to start two mules while I was in college and they were eight and 10 years old, had never been started. And their names were talls and smalls. Like smalls was maybe 14 hands if he was lucky. <laughs> and tall was about 16, three. Oh, nice. Yeah. Beautiful mover. Beautiful mover. Um, he was a handful. I had a hard time with him. Uh, he just had him. There was some mental stuff going on, and he he would bolt. And I wouldn't call it from out of nowhere, or you know, your four reasonings, you know, four no reason out of nowhere, and mm-hmm. all that stuff, because you knew it was coming. <laughs> and you know, you you just better hang on, and you try to get him roll around. And but those mules, you know, the smalls, I'd get up at six o'clock in the morning, we go chase deer on him. Okay. And yeah. It was so much fun, but you had to pull him up before the deer cubby went in, like into the woods, because he'd drag you through it. And, gotcha. Yep. Uh, and as I got, I was trying to, I was learning about them. They were, they, I wouldn't say they were all too different, um, but they kind of were in their own way. And I think it was, uh, it was either Ray or Tom that said they're like a horse, just more so. Right. And absolutely, one hundred and ten percent. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what summed it up. And I didn't hear that until after I had rode those horses or those mules. But, um, you know, in terms of getting them into a snaffle, I'd start riding them in a snaffle in a controlled environment and go through the same process mm-hmm. of connecting those reins down to the feet. They all, they understand how to operate off your seat. When you turn, when you pull left, they go left. When you pull right, they go right. And they follow that feel out there. Um, and don't try to push them through it, you know, because – they're just they're different critters at the end of the day right and they they're not as forgiving i don't feel and but man they can be talented and they can be a lot of fun i mean i didn't have that tall one he was more of a i needed a better insurance policy to be getting on him yeah but uh for the little one oh him and i i've got some pictures of me riding him and it's just amusing because we could do a rain or stop if i put my heels down (laughs) and you know, he was, but he was so much fun. Like he wanted to go out and do stuff. Uh-huh. And so, I mean, we tried, someone was teaching me how to hobble train one. And I, 
you know, <laughs> it didn't work. This thing could, you know, you'd hobble him and he'd canter around, like, no matter what to do with the night, never hobble trained anything at that point. And this little sucker was so crafty. And he had it figured out. Everything. And, but it was a fun, you know, I, the mules were interesting, but, you know, the fact that they're just like horses, just more so. And right. I would go with that. And the fact that, um, yeah, get them in a round pen or get them in an arena and put a snaffle on them and just get back to the fundamentals, get back to the basics. Right. And, and uh, uh, they'll, they'll, you'll both figure it out. It might take some time, but stick yep. with it. Yep. Absolutely. Well, and you know, I, I laugh all the time about a line that I heard Ray say once, uh, he said, you know, God, God made the horse. God didn't make the mule. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. man, man made the mule. God man made, made the, the horse. Mule. God didn't exactly make the mule. Yeah. But, yeah, for sure. But, um, yeah. And you know, I mean, I've had, I've ridden several mules, driven several mules, broke plenty to ride and drive and that sort of thing. Uh, and what I find with them uh, particularly, you know, we talk about horses learning what they live and, and learning it the way that they live it. I find a lot of times with the mule, it really sticks the oh, way yeah. that they learned it, you know. So that can be sometimes pretty challenging. And I know I've got some students that, uh, that also, as Chris is talking about, have some mules that were ridden, were started, were, you know, when they bought them, they were going in the correction bits or even in some pretty barbaric, ugly pieces of garbage. I mean, equipment. Um, right. yeah, and, and it's taken them quite a while, but they have been successful transitioning them into snaffles or whatever other, you know, headgear they wanted them to go in. But it was a long road. Yeah, I mean, people say that they're tough mouth, and I wouldn't necessarily say that, but no. it's a lot of mental. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Like and that it's not so much that the fact that they're going to be willing to pull on you. It's just that mentally that's where they're at. I mean, that's what they're going to do. It's not the fact that they've got, you know, leather in their mouth for gums. It's not that at all. It's right. just, just the fact that mentally you've got a lot more to work there. And, like you said, you know, God made the horse and man made the mules. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I think with some of the mules that I work with, and, and I love them. Absolutely, I love them. I, I adore them. Uh, I don't think I've ever ridden a bad mule or driven a bad mule, which is probably a good thing. Um, if if there is even such a thing, I've heard guys say there might be, but I've never met one. Uh, but you know, I think a lot of times if you're starting a colt or if you're if you're working a horse, you can play checkers. But when you're when you're starting a mule or working a mule, you got to be able to play chess. You know, oh, yeah. you, you got to be thinking a little farther ahead, and you should always be thinking a little farther ahead. But I feel like with a mule, you have to. So. Yeah, I think in that uh, I had when you said that deal that Ray said. You know, I think I, I have the DVD where he's at a clinic and they just had him on audio. And oh, really? I was listening to it after the fact that he made that comment about the mules. He said, like, the horses, they'll fill in for you where you might be lacking. But the mules, they might make your life just a little more difficult or they, um, they're they not as willing to help you out. Like, they may not be looking to, oh, you're going to do this, so I'm going to help you out. Like, they're not – they may not operate, you know. And right. I was right. – you know, I only, I've started those two, and so I'm, that's not enough for me to make a generalization on the whole mm -hmm. breed. Right. But – um, I can definitely see where it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, hopefully Chris, that helps you out and anybody else who might be listening to that's, that's riding a mule that wants to try to kind of transition them into a different piece of headgear. Uh, so let's see. So Joanne asks a question, Colton, are your horsemanship ideas similar to the principles of Ray Hunt and John Lyons? Well, definitely Ray Hunt. Um, I'm not, honestly, I've spent a little time with Josh Lyons, but I haven't spent a lot of time, or I haven't spent, I've only had, I've had dinner with John once, but I haven't really got to learn from him or like watch him teach by any means. Um, so I can't really make, um, an assumption there, um, in terms of John Lyons, but when it comes down to Ray Hunt, Tom Dorrance, Bach, and, um, all those those kind of guys, my I I really look up to those guys and what they offer and what they bring to the table and how they teach or mm -hmm. not necessarily how they teach but what they teach and um, that style of horsemanship. So mm -hmm. yep, very cool, good, good. I know there's one guy I can say that you you uh, 
your principles followed just like him, uh, and that would be Colton Woods. Oh, right? Absolutely. That, that was always kind of my answer when folks would ask, well, you know, who do you, who do you train like? I said, well, I train like Patrick King, you know, yep. uh, because it doesn't matter what we're, uh, what we're trying to come across with or whose ideas might be in the back of our mind. It, it's going to come across the way we put it across in those, in those moments, and we just hope that's fitting to the horses. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've, I've definitely had people come and take lessons, and they're like, oh, I, I saw that you rode with so-and-so. I'd love to come take a lesson from you because I like, and they assume that your principles are aligned with mm -hmm. other people just because maybe you rode with them one time or maybe you spent a year and a half with them or whatever mm -hmm. the situation may be. And they turn up and they tell you that. I'm like, well, I hope you're not going to be disappointed, but I do my own thing. I take right. what works for me. And certainly it might be modeled after um, or it might have more strong tendencies to be relatable to another horseman that's out there teaching. But at the end of the day, like what works for them doesn't always work for me. And right. so when you, when you take a lesson with me, it's like, you're like you said, Patrick, like you're getting me. Yeah. And, um, it's just an accumulation of what I've been able to fortunate enough to experience. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So. Good. Okay. So that looks like all the questions that we have coming in for here. So, um, coming up, have you got any kind of new projects or new plans coming up? Um, you know, as we get into the winter months, um, you know, my big focus is riding my own personal horses, and we've got some young warm bloods in, so we're doing our best to get them started off on the right foot. Um, we're working on our 2018 schedule, and part of one of our plans, you know, I ended up actually picking up a little broodmare um, last September, and so we'll be bringing her in the spring. And one of my goals with the horsemanship and everything is – I love teaching the clinics and teaching lessons and everything and starting colts. And one of the things I'd love to be doing is bringing some of my own horses, offering them for sale, mm -hmm. as well as getting to ride some of the own horses that I've bred. So we've got a cool little, cool little mare coming in. Uh, she's there. She's hanging out in her paddock. And, um, she'll be getting bred in the spring. And uh, so I'm pretty excited about that. That's and, great. Yeah. So we're always trying something new. You, if you jump on her Facebook or whatever, you'll um, – Mer if, if it's fortunate because, you know, my wife, Meredith, if she had to take, you know, a sip of wine every time I said I had an idea, we'd be in big trouble <laughs> because I spend a lot of time commuting and driving and I come up with right. some, you know, all sorts of ideas and I, go, I get home and I say, I've got an idea. And she goes, oh, yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah, with the so, commute, you've got lots of time for thinking, right? Absolutely. <laughs> oh, goodness. That's great. That's great. Well, we always need somebody to ground us, too. You know, that is true. It's, it's, there's there's true. the ideas person and there's the reality person, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. So, okay, so I've just got a couple kind of wrap up questions for us here. If you're game for that, unless there's something else you want to touch on specific. No, let's get into it. Okay, cool. So, Colton, if there was one specific thing you'd recommend for riders to focus on as a primary means of improving their horsemanship, what would that be? Besides just riding in general and spending the time on your horses and riding, I would say go out and ride with people that are better than you. Um, mm -hmm. Go out and surround yourself with people that are more experienced, that have put in more miles, that have you know, rode, rode more horses, like whatever the situation is, or surround yourself with people that um, maybe they're doing a certain, you know, whatever they may be doing with their horsemanship, Maybe they're doing something that intrigues you. Go spend some time with them. Just, you know, shoot them a message on Facebook or Instagram or give them a call and surround yourself with people that are better than yourself mm -hmm. and keep riding. I think that's perfect. I think that's perfect. What is that they say? You you are the average of the five people you hang around with the most? Absolutely. And I agree with right. my dad preached that, you yeah. know, and I'd always, you know, it's always good to kind of, think about that like right now you know when you say it i'm like all right who are the five people that are surrounding me mm. and then whether it's in a business sense or with your horsemanship or whatever um, right definitely makes a huge impact right yeah absolutely i think uh i i preach this to to folks all over the country sometimes they need to pick those five people a little a little uh a little more on purpose instead of just accidentally <laughs> absolutely <laughs> yeah so cool all right if you could ride with anyone Past or present, who would it be and why? 
I, I see. I still know this question's coming, and I'm like, <laughs> do I have to pick one? No, um, you don't have to pick one. You can name twenty if you want to, so long as you can give a reason why for all of them. You know, because I'll never have the opportunity to ride with these two individuals unless there's you know a big open green field and we get to ride bridle horses after we leave this earth. I love to ride with Tom and Ray mm. because I know, um, like you had the opportunity to, and there's a lot of people that did, but that's like one of those things like, you know, I can still go out and ride with people that are still walking around the earth. Mm -hmm. Um, and I can still make that happen. But those two guys, I know even Bill Dorps, um, mm -hmm. that whole group, I'd love the opportunity to have just been a fly on the wall, if anything at all. Yeah. And, kind of watched what they did or, you know, picked their brain or whatever. So, yeah, yeah. Tom Ray, Bill would definitely be um, three that I'd love to ride with. For I'd sure. love to have the opportunity to ride with. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I got the chance to ride with Ray. I, uh, unfortunately, I didn't get the chance to ride with Tom, but that's, yeah. that that They would probably be three on top of my list, too, for yeah. sure. For sure. So what's your present personal definition of horsemanship? I would say that right now, based on where I'm at, is that horsemanship, by best way I can define it, is it's the journey in further understanding and refining our abilities to communicate with our horses. I like it. All right. How can folks find you? Oh, uh, yeah. ColdwoodsHorsemanship.com is our website. Um, or you can put coltonwoods.com. We've got our horsemanship page. It's Colton Woods Horsemanship on, at Facebook as well as Instagram. And we do a little bit of Snapchat occasionally, and that's CW Horsemanship. So, and if you get on there, guys, my phone number's up there. You're welcome to give me a call, shoot us an email, sign up for the newsletter, um, or check out the videos that we post. We've got a blog going as well as our um, Facebook page. So, yeah. Perfect. Yeah, and it looks like your website just got a new a new update, right? I got on it today. I haven't been on it for a little while. And, yeah, uh, my wife Meredith, um, she does. She handles. I handle all the content and the photos and stuff like that. But she's the one that makes it all look pretty snazzy, and you know that's what she does for a living. So um, anyone that might be looking for a website, particularly she works with a lot of equine businesses, you can check out Meredith Davis Design, and perfect. she can do marketing materials and websites and all sorts of stuff. That's awesome. That's awesome. And I've seen some of her work. She does a great, great job. That's very cool. Yep. All right. You knew it was coming up. You've been preparing for it. You've been sitting on your hands so that you don't <laughs> give yourself away. The question of the day, I don't have to explain it to you because you've had the question of the day several times with me now. So what is our question of the day for the audience to answer? All right. So what is what have you found to be the most effective learning environment for you when you're progressing your horsemanship? So is it lessons, private lessons, clinics, um, or anything like whatever you've experienced in the past, what have you found to be the most effective way in an environment to progress your horsemanship? I think that's an awesome question. Gang, give us your answers in the comment section below this video. I know Colton's gonna be checking in to Absolutely. see what your answers are for that, and I'm gonna be doing the same. That's pretty awesome. Colton, this has been a ton of fun. Uh, and you're still alive. We said at the beginning you were feeling kind of under the weather. You don't sound under the weather now. When I first called you, you sounded all groggy and stuff, and, and you sure turned it on, so I hope you don't go, like, hurling when we're done with this call. I hope not. I've been doing that all day, so <laughs> oh, that doesn't gosh. come back up. <laughs> gosh, wow, that's terrible. But thank you so much for joining me. This has been so much fun. I look forward, of course, to the chance to ride Hopefully this signal is, there we go, the signal's back on here. So, uh, gang, I want to thank you for tuning in for episode number 18 of Talking About Horses. 
I really appreciate you giving Colton and I your ear. Please remember that if you've missed any of it, you can access the full broadcast through Facebook, YouTube, or by streaming from iTunes. Through whatever outlet you're listening, please be sure to give us a rating, a comment, a review, and a share. Your word of mouth is the fuel for this fire. Tune in next week for Talking About Horses when I'll be joined by Liberty Trainer and Horsemanship Clinician, Ariana Sakaris. Thanks, gang.